All right. Go ahead and just get things kick started here. And as people <laughs> join in, they can catch up. Um, and the information that we put here together today and make available will also be available on our YouTube channel later. Um, so hopefully it won't be anything anyone is able to miss if they're not trying. So uh, just wanted to give a big thank you and a welcome. Uh, I'm Zach Riley. I am the CEO of the Colorado Livestock Association. And I want to welcome everybody to our uh, informational call here this afternoon with our Beef Council representatives, Colorado Beef Council, led by a uh, team captain here, Todd Ingley. Uh, he is the executive over there, and we are sure glad to be friends with Todd and his company and appreciate all the hard work that they do for the industry in promoting beef and beef consumption um, throughout the state of Colorado. So, Todd, I don't have a your usually very lengthy and detailed uh, bio for all the things that you've done, but uh, your industry contributions are uh, far and wide, and we are very grateful for who you are and what you do. So, Todd, I'm just going to kick it over to you, and thank you once again. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks much for, for allowing us a time to give a quick update of what we're doing with uh, checkoff dollars in the state of Colorado and how all that works. I'm going to share the screen here. Right quick, as a point of housekeeping, yeah. if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Uh, staff will be monitoring that, and uh, that way we can make it available to the Beef Council folks and then get that answered in a timely fashion. Thank you. Good deal. Can you see my slides? All right. Well, again, my name is Todd Ingley. I'm the I'm executive director for the Colorado Beef Council. Um, today, we're going to highlight a lot of the programs that we're doing um, with the Beef Council. My section here, initially, I'm going to talk uh, about some beef demand issues um, that we see coming up here in 2023-2024, um, highlight some uh, consumer perception um, and kind of how that plays a role in, in what we do and how we decide on our programming and how we decide how we engage consumers. And then uh, kind of highlight some elements of our uh, revised strategic platform so you get an idea of where we're going in the programs that, that we do. So again, you know, kind of the, the basic thing I always like to, to talk about is just the purpose of the checkoff. So it was, it was established and, and funded and governed by beef producers. Um, we're in our 36th year now at the national level. Um, Colorado has had a state level checkoff <clears throat> program since 1965. But what, what happens now, the current program is a dollar is paid every time a beef animal is sold and importers also pay. So any product that's being imported, they also contribute to uh, the beef checkoff. The programs that we um, can, can fund and, and run on behalf of the industry, uh, truly a state and national partnership, I'll explain that here in a little bit, but anything that has to do with education, um, marketing, promotion, or research. So really, when you look at that, we impact demand. Um, we, really, we really don't have much influence over the, the cattle market, um, but we do have an influence over demand, uh, consumer demand for our product. <clears throat> so where does that dollar go? Um, the, the checkoff program here in Colorado, we do have USDA oversight. Um, they oversee and put their stamp of approval on our budget, our marketing plan, all of our messaging. Um, we also have to um, undergo annual audits, both at a state level and a national level. We just finished our annual um, audit last week, as a matter of fact. So um, anyway, that $1 is collected. We keep 50 cents for state level programs. The other 50 cents gets paid on to the Cattlemen's Beef Board for national level programs. So if you look at, um, you know, 2023 and where we are right now. I have a lot of people both within the industry and outside of the industry that are like, well, so what are the what are the factors that you guys are facing? And I can really boil it down to three main categories. Um, we're still experiencing a disruption in the supply chain um, coming from the pandemic all the way through. And some of those things aren't necessarily really related back to the pandemic, but um, we're still seeing a lot of inflation and input costs, um, right? That's impacting both the consumer side and the producer side. Um, weather has been a big impact and labor issues continue to be an issue, again, both on the consumer side and the production side. 
And then when you look at the uh, consumer, we've got a new pro, uh, what we're calling a new protein consumer that's, that's kind of evolving here. But I think it's interesting that, that consumers now, it's kind of this intersection of people, um, the planet, and, and animals. So um, there's this super heightened awareness about how all of those things go together and in influencing how consumers make decisions on what they do. Um, they trust companies um, and brands that, that, have a, that, that can back up what they're claiming that they're selling. Um, sustainability is huge. Health and nutrition is huge. And then animal welfare, you'll see in a little bit in some of our market research is really big. And um, another thing that's impacting this new protein consumer is um, social acceptance of production practices. So th that's that's a huge thing. It's really that's probably more the more the complex element out of out of everything that we're dealing with. Um, and then international marketing. And I'll show you a little bit later in our program. But when almost five hundred dollars of added value um, to each fed animal comes from international marketing programs, that's huge. So we got to we have to make sure and recognize that, that that's big and plays a very important role in the beef industry. So um, as far as beef goes as a, as a protein, we're really in a strong, we're really in a strong um, uh, uh, in a strong place. Um, you can see here um, per capita net beef consumption. Um, been on an increase since that 2014-2015 um, low, um, and even even in, in slight increase into uh, as we finished out 2022. But what you can see, um, the USDA is forecasting a pretty pretty dramatic uh, reduction in in uh, net beef consumption, probably mostly due to supply shortages and inflation. So that's kind of an interesting, again, that's a forecast, but that's interesting to see. So I think, you know, contraction of the domestic cattle herd, which would impact our supplies, um, uh, gives us a, a, an area that we need to be concerned about and keep our eyes on. When you look at consumer, um, per capita consumer expenditures, I think this is a great chart. Um, going back to 1988, you can, you can kind of see what, what per person, what they were spending on beef. And of course, um, if you look at 2020 during the height of the pandemic, um, of course, that's when we saw, um, you know, the meat cases being emptied out and super high demand, very low supply. So prices were at their peak at that time. But you can look at where we are now. It's come down just slightly, like decreased 2% from where we were this time last year. But um, we're still at, at, at overall high. So so um, still something that we need to be aware of and, and keep in mind. This is kind of related to that in a way, um, but to me, nothing shows value to consumer more than where they're willing to spend their money, right? So this chart kind of shows how much consumers value beef over our closest competing protein. Um, so that black line is steak, uh, the red line is ground beef, and the yellow line is chicken. So you can see that um, consumers really, um, I wouldn't say prefer, but they hold beef at a, at a high level. They're willing to spend um, more money for our product than, than other competing choices. And what we're so showing is that consumers aren't necessarily right now trading protein choices um, because of price, um, but they are spacing out their beef purchases. So they may not be purchasing beef as frequently. They're still spending the money but they're spacing that out. They're not, they're not shifting. Hopefully that makes sense. They're not shifting to different proteins. So um, bottom line, when we, ask, can, when we ask consumers in our ongoing research, this is research that's being done at a national level and a state level um, every month, every week of every month of, of the year. Um, what is their number one pro protein choice? And again, this is, isn't based off of any sales numbers or you know anything like that. It's just like asking consumers, what's your number one choice of protein? So you can see in this chart that you know coming out of the pandemic, beef was was ranked, you know, we were highest. We were in the number one. And then um, coming into the beginning of the year, we were kind of battling again with chicken, um, going back and forth. But since then, uh, beef remains remains a consumer's number one protein choice. In this chart, um, the aqua color is beef, the yellow is chicken. Um, the red line there is meat alternatives, and the purple line is pork. 
<clears throat> so of course, there's always a lot of questions from consumers or from producers um, about meat, or I mean, about like, why, why is that? Um, why do we rank higher? And, and bottom line, it comes down to taste. Taste is helping keep uh, beef king of the meat case. So that's a great sign there. It shows us that beef is in a strong position in the meat case and, and in consumers' minds. A lot of producers ask about plant-based products. Um, basically, um, seems like after the initial attention that meat alternatives received, um, consumers really haven't returned um, um, haven't returned back to them once once they tried them um, as meat alternative producers have planned. Um, so it, it's still something that's on the radar. We need to keep our eyes on, and we do constantly. Um, but we see that element of protein uh, consumption by consumers decreasing. I think what's going to be very interesting is, you know, coming up um, on our radar will be the reaction uh, that, that uh, consumers have to cell-based, cell-grown products. That's kind of an unknown. We'll kind of see how that develops over time. Let me look at um, detailed um, market research for consumers here in Colorado. Um, the 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 pie charts on the left are national research and the pie charts on the right are Colorado. So you can see that perception of beef remains really strong. In fact, Colorado, um, the positive perception of beef outranks uh, what the national level um, is. So that's positive. Um, but when you look, what, what catches my eye on this, is when you look down at the perception of beef production, that's where we're suffering a little bit. Look at how much that negative, that red uh, section of that pie chart grows. Um, and then how much the neutral also grows, which means that that blue, that positive decreases. So I think um, this kind of highlights what Colorado consumers are thinking and doing and, and we get a look into their purchasing behavior. So obviously we need to do a good job and communicate um, about um, how beef is produced to help increase their perception. Um, it, what's kind of funny, uh, while consumers admit they have neutral or negative perceptions on production, only 27% of them claim to be familiar with how cattle are raised. So there's that gap, right? And that's where I think the beef checkoff can, can come in and be of most use to the industry is help fill that gap, right? We need to make sure consumers are familiar with how cattle are raised so that we don't have that negative perception, right? So teaching and informing consumers about how we do this, um, is, is the big hurdle to having them purchase and consume more of our product. When you look, when we ask them, you know, what are their biggest concerns? You know, if you are concerned about, about that, um, about how uh, beef production is done, what, what are your concerns? And by far the biggest, the biggest concern from consumers is animal welfare. So again, we need to communicate how we take care of animals and, and why we do the things that we do. Um, we started just this last quarter um, to try to get a better handle on how large, large of a market, uh, direct marketing really is. We started asking questions about this. So as you can see here, um, you know, a lot of consumers have purchased directly from a farmer or ranch, and this could be included at a farmer's market. Um, but out of all the products that they have purchased, look at that on the right-hand side, beef is by by far purchased more often than some of these other products um, direct from the farm. So I think it's just kind of an interesting, you know, uh, we have that uh, local beef directory that's available on our website that producers can sign up for and that consumers can access to find somebody close to them to purchase directly. And it's just something we wanted to kind of keep an eye on and, and see that I think it, it is, this definitely substantiates our, our thought that, it, that that is a, an important area that consumers are purchasing uh, products from. Um, so we get all this information from consumers, all of our research, what do we do with that? Um, so what we've done is we've been able to um, utilize that and find out where we need to place emphasis with our marketing and promotion programs. Um, so each year we look at this and see what areas we need to um, put emphasis as far as what we do. This all ties into the national level beef industry long range plan, which is updated every five years. So again, this is showing how this state and the national partnership come together so that we are coordinating things, programming and messaging. So these are the top three areas that Colorado is working on, cons growing consumer trust, supporting international marketing and advocating the multiple advantages of beef. When you dial that down, our, our primary target audiences are producers, 
um, health influencers and beef inquisitive consumers. And these are, these are consumers that, um, that are, that are aware of, of the product. They support our product, but they have some concerns and maybe some questions. And so those are kind of the target target areas of who we're focusing um, with or focusing on. If you look at where our focus areas are going to be consumers, we're going to be talking a lot about social acceptance of production practices. Um, we're going to be highlighting the beef quality assurance program that we work with um, with CSU on and other animal care programs, communicating the value of how we produce product and, and how they can be confident of the source of their of their beef. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more emphasis on nutrition and health and outreach uh, to that community, which Kate will be talking about in a little bit. Also, um, highlighting some collaborative partnerships, being creative with who we're doing things with and programming with. And then, of course, uh, international marketing programs is big. As far as producers go, we're going to be focusing on explaining what and why we do uh, the things that we do with our consumer programs, trying to help them understand the direction that we're going part of what we're doing here today, um, giving some background about why, what and why we're doing the things that we do. Then also there's always room to, to um, communicate better on how the Beef Council functions and what the parameters and how and the, the, the guidelines that we have to operate within. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it off to Kate Schultz, who is our um, uh, consulting nutritionist and she'll take it from there, Kate. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Todd. Uh, my name is Kate Schultz, and I'm the consulting registered dietitian for the Colorado Beef Council. I am going to share today some of the programming that we have just completed for this last fiscal year, and then talk a little bit about future programming um, as well. So we will review some of the information in regards to some physician and nurse practitioner outreach, also take a deeper dive into some of the dietetic internship programming, and then end up with the beef industry farm tours that we have been holding. So just a little bit about what I do for the Colorado Beef Council. I really am responsible for anything in regards to nutrition or health, um, but specifically, I really work to build relationships with dietetic internship programs in an effort to inform interns about the beef industry. Uh, we have previously worked with UNC, CSU, Metro State, um, Children's Hospital, Colorado, and there's a brand new program also in Colorado uh, at the VA that we're looking at working with. I represent the Colorado Beef Council and act as a liaison with different health organizations such as the Colorado Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the National Nurse Practitioner Symp Symposium and also represent the Colorado Beef Council um, and act as a spokesperson really on anything regarding nutrition, health, and issues management. This next slide is a slide that I like to use with all of my audiences that really show that we have made a commitment in the industry um, with the statement of pr principles regarding nutrition and health. So depending on whom I'm visiting with, um, I will go through all of these seven uh, you know, goals here or commitments that we have made. Uh, the one that I wanted to share today was really that we will provide factual, scientifically supported information about beef to help consumers make informed choices about what they eat. We also recognize the important role of healthcare professionals and nutrition educators in providing nutrition information and are committed to working with them and their professional organizations to communicate accurate information about nutrition and health. A lot of the work that I do stems around dispelling a lot of myths and misperceptions in the industry. And so whether I'm working with consumers or with fellow medical professionals, I like to showcase this and the statement of principles that we have and just the commitment that we have made to providing factually, scientifically supported information. So the first campaign that I wanted to share a little bit um, with you about was the Strong Mind, Strong Body Physician campaign that we participated in this last um, year through NCBA. So this was a campaign where materials were sent specifically um, out to physicians' offices. So in the state of Colorado, we were able to reach um, over 200 family practice and pediatric health professionals, including doctors, nurse practitioners, um, registered nurses, PAs, and DOs. And in this packet or this toolkit um, that we called it, each kit contained some of the materials that you can see here uh, on the slide. So here at the did you know section, this was a tear sheet that the medical professionals could use with their patients. 
to be able to say, you know, we received it, this information. Um, there's some great tips and tricks here for your family on how to include, you know, beef, uh, you know, pretty essentially every day um, in their diets. And so the uh, visual here on the right was really um, the toolkit that was provided or the teaching um, mechanism that was provided for the audiences. And then they were able to also send home a take home for um, their patients, which was awesome. We had amazing results from this uh, in that eight and 10 respondents are more likely to recommend beef for school age children after having received the materials. And then 75% more knowledgeable about the role of beef as a nutritious, high quality protein food to support children. And 91% of respondents have recommended or intend to recommend beef to school aged children as a result of the campaign. We are really looking at building on this campaign as well. Uh, we had amazing results with our eating in the early years physician campaign, and now with the strong mind, strong body campaign. So it's really um, a wonderful opportunity that we are able to engage with NCBA to be able to have this outreach to physicians because we oftentimes struggle in being able to get in front of them. But this is an opportunity to provide the toolkit. It's a direct ship to their office. We have their information. They can opt in for more information. And the results show that this was just incredibly um, beneficial and very, very valuable for us. This next slide here uh, is talking a little bit about the National Nurse Practitioners Conference that we have participated in um, in some way for the last five years. So we were proud to participate um, this last July in Keystone, Colorado. This is a nationwide conference that is held every year in Keystone. Um, and again, this being the fifth year that we have participated, this year we exhibited. So you can see a picture of our exhibit um, here on the left-hand side. We really focused on, again, utilizing that information from the Strong Mind, Strong Body Toolkit to share these resources with practitioners. Nurse practitioners are also a really, really great group in the fact that they are incredibly engaged. Um, they're helpers. They want to learn and soak up as much information as they can. And oftentimes they're not only seeking information for their patients, but then also for themselves. So we were able to share um, information on how a, a beef can fit into a heart healthy diet. We shared American Heart Association approved recipe cards and brochures. And then again, shared um, all of the information in regards to the Strong Mind, Strong Body uh, toolkit. We also had, which is incredibly popular, um, the Build Your Own Beef Jerky Trail Mix. So you can see in the bottom left-hand corner of that, um, just little packages of Jack's Links. They can pop open the top and add in all of their nuts and, and uh, fruit and uh, chocolate. And it's an amazing, way to be able to engage with this group and continue to engage. So they now know that we bring jerky um, and it just allows for a lot of wonderful conversation. Um, we also were able to get over a hundred um, contacts from this opportunity where they stop at the booth, we're able to scan um, their name tag. So it really allows for follow-up after the conference as well and is able to make a large impact. Um, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association sponsored a lunch um, with nationally accredited speaker, Jim White, and he spoke about the opportunities and really challenges of modern wellness. Again, this was an audience who was not only looking for information information uh, for their patients that they could use to provide practical tips and tricks, really focusing on the importance of including, um, you know, protein in every meal and ways to do that. So from breakfast, you know, to lunch, to dinner, um, practical applications to be able to do that as well. And so we are already looking into 2024, uh, planning our session for next July. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to share that information once we get that secured, hopefully by October of this year. Next year, the dietetic internship training. So in Colorado, um, there are a handful of dietetic internship programs, and this is a requirement that dietitians um, must complete in order to become a registered dietitian. And so we have the pleasure of being able to work with uh, a couple of them, and we were able to host this last February um, a, a host a, a joint dietetic internship training where we had students from Metro State University and then also Children's Hospital Colorado come together again at NCBA really for a day of learning and kind of pivoting on what Todd had shared um, in regards to this new protein consumer. 
this is an audience where they are incredibly um, interested in sustainability. They're incredibly interested in animal welfare. And so oftentimes when we are sending out a pre-survey uh, and we're asking them you know, their, their questions and their concerns, a lot of it does surround sustainability um, and animal welfare. So the morning really consisted of a beef foundation and fact presentation that I uh, was able to complete, really talking about the myths and misperceptions. And then we pivoted to a two hour sustainability panel where we had a producer, um, a faculty member from CSU Ag Next, and then we also had a sustainability expert from NCBA. So we really hit it from every single angle in regards to sustainability, sharing what producers are doing, sharing, sharing what the industry is doing, and sharing what is uh, going on from an academia uh, perspective. In the afternoon, then we uh, shifted a little bit and had a hands-on opportunity where the interns were able to go into the Beef It's What's For Dinner Culinary Center, where, um, you know, fellow nationally recognized dietitians are able to share out content and share out and create their own content. So they were able to uh, take information that I had shared with them earlier in the day and share out nutrition tips and tricks, whether it be about consuming protein at breakfast or um, you know, beef as a first food for infants. So it really was a wonderful opportunity to bring these interns together um, for a day of learning. And we're planning on being able to continue this programming into next year. We also have a presentation to UNC um, this fall. And then something that is also exciting is that uh, for the first time ever, we will have a dietetic intern from Metro State University spend two weeks with us um, really learning everything about the Colorado Beef Council um, and agriculture in general. So this is really the most comprehensive intern opportunity to date, and we're really looking forward to building that out. And lastly, and kind of what Todd had also talked about, um, you know, when I'm talking about fellow medical professionals and I'm wanting to educate them so that they can then educate their patients, they're also consumers themselves. So not only do we want to be able to, um, you know, dispel myths and misperceptions for them and for their patients, but also um, encourage them as consumers to recognize that, you know, beef is such a nutritional powerhouse and answer a lot of those questions and concerns they may have about production practices. And one of the things that we have learned that has worked really, really well is being able to host uh, beef industry farm tours. So this last May, we were able to host a group of 20. Um, some of them were dietetic interns, some of them were dietitians, um, and then some of them were from our team beef, we're team beef members. So we were able to gather. Um, we also send out a pre-survey and then a post-survey. And from the pre-survey, um, nobody that had, had participated had ever uh, been on a farm or a ranch before. And then from this, 100% of the participants in the post survey indicated that today's learning opportunity resulted in a positive perception change of the beef industry. Also, 100% of the participants indicated that they would utilize the information that they learned about beef, beef nutrition and cattle ranching as a part of a balanced diet with future clients, current family, and friends. And we really just were able to kind of capture um, specifically from one participant that what really caught their attention was the interconnect interconnectedness between the breeding, feeding, genetics, and land management. For, for this participant, it was truly impressive. And he left the tour with a newfound appreciation for the hard work and dedication that goes into farming and ranching. So we are also looking at expanding this um, and not only continuing to do what I kind of consider um, the beef industry farm tour 1.0, but then also a more advanced beef industry farm tour for those who want to learn even more, maybe about the processing um, you know, of the animal. And so we are in the works of, of planning that for 2024. So continuing just being able to get individuals out in front of producers um, and being able to, you know, really truly understand why producers do what they do and being able to put that all together. So at this point in time, I'm happy to answer any questions now or be able to wait until the end. Okay, well, let's um, keep moving. I'm Julie Moore. I am the Director of Nutrition and Education. And today I'm gonna to give you an update on some of the education things that have happened in the last fiscal year, and then just some outreach um, that could help you. So the Beef Grant is a program that's been part of the Colorado Beef Council for 23 years. And it's reimbursement, fully reimbursement. They send in all their receipts and I look through them all and we only pay for beef. 
um, to so that their students can cook in class. And a lot of instructors tell us that if it weren't for the beef grant, they wouldn't cook any proteins. So we really do think, feel like this makes an impact. Um, last year, that it helped 13,410 students. And that's even after um, cutting middle school out, just because as our budgets are the same, we have to make do with what we've got. But it was still 369 classrooms. And we fully expect that it'll be the same, um, if not more this year. Uh, with the price of beef, everyone's looking for help wherever they can find it. And a couple of these pictures there, um, students cooking, uh, the plating of their product, which you can see is medium rare, so they're learning well what to do. Um, one classroom, they put a cow on the wall and everybody writes down something they learned about uh, the different big cuts, the primals. And then on the lower right, one teacher during COVID, and then she's continued to work and use it, and she's in Greeley, did a breakout box, which to me, I had no idea what that was, but it's like a scavenger hunt. And so there were clues and then they answered them and just more things that they learned about beef uh, remotely, but still are continuing. The other fun thing we did, well, it's fun for me, and the teachers had fun too, is um, the On the Farm STEM program. Now, this is a program funded through the Beef Board with the American Farm Bureau Federation for Agriculture, and this is the seventh year, and this year it was in Colorado. So for three and a half days, these teachers got to go around Colorado, and pretty close because they um, were staying in Denver and learn more about the beef industry. And so we are very thankful to CLA members, Five Rivers, um, Agnext, Leachman. Uh, while we were at Leachman, we then went to the Roberts Ranch and then spent part of Wednesday at the CSU Spur. Uh, 90, 29 teachers came. They were from 15 states. And really, if you look at their districts, because we had some curriculum district people and we look at all they could reach, just those 29 teachers have the opportunity to reach 1.6 million students. In fact, on, a, on the pre and post survey that they did, the pre-survey <clears throat> about, the, about the positive perception of how cattle are are raised, um, it only 44% thought that that was positive. But after that three and a half days, um, it was at 96%. And 96% also said that beef production is very important or extremely important to society. Uh, one, this, next slide. Uh, through the years, uh, teachers from very large metro areas have been a part of this program. Um, so Los Angeles, Chicago, DC area, Dallas, Atlanta, Seattle, New York, and Denver. And um, on the next slide, we're actually gonna hear from a teacher who is in New York City. Science is an abstract subject. Uh, most people don't go into the sciences and agriculture is very much a science. Although students don't see it as a science because so much is done for them uh, unless they're involved in this industry. So again, it's about giving them a lot of information so that when they read the paper or they see something on TV, they have a better sense of what the reality is. And that just may, will mean that they're a better decision maker about you know, the foods that they eat and the policies that you know, um, regulate the food industry. So it was a great um, event in June. And then lastly, I wanna talk just a little bit about local foods. So last fall, Prop FF, which um, is now being called Healthy School Meals for All, passed um, with a voter ballot. And so that means right now there's free meals for all students for districts that have opted in. And then next fall, the local food purchasing part will be added into that. And the regulation for that is Colorado grown, raised, or processed. And less only 25% of that can be processed, like fully processed. So really we're talking about single ingredient items like beef, like peaches, like um, other Colorado products. So it, the goal is really to help Colorado's food system and local farmers and ranchers. One way you can uh, participate in this and, and learn more is if you're interested um, is you can, as Todd mentioned, you can sign up for our local beef directory, which is on our website. Um, that's the only uh, database really that we have of people who are interested in 
selling beef to consumers or schools. And so that's what I use when we get new information. Prop FF um, is just massive because there's going to be 9 million or up to $17 million a year available for schools purchasing local foods. Um, they're working on, and I'm helping them with a rancher resource because it's really hard to, to speak school speak and understand their buying systems and their lingo and uh, that variety. So I've been helping the organizers with, you know, a kind of a quick cheat sheet and as well as helping the school districts understand that ranchers and processors in Colorado have um, different sizes, different packs. It's almost like uh, the schools need to say, okay, we're looking for a roast. They don't care if it's a chuck roast or round roast or whatever, they're going to shred it. So in their world, it's just a roast. And so trying to get some of that common language pulled together is what we're work working on together. So uh, again, if you go to the Colorado Beef Council website, cobeef.com, if that's something you'd like to have more information about, um, sign up for the local directory and then you'll be on that list. And with that, I think, Todd, it's time for me, yes, to turn it over to Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Zasko, and I'm a contractor to the Colorado Beef Council. I technically work for Novitas Communications, a PR firm in Denver. Today, I'm going to be talking a bit about reputation management, media outreach, and advertising. So first, we're going to talk about reputation management. Um, this is kind of NOTAS's big initiative here at the Beef Council. We're really focusing on streamlining all of the communications, both to our producers and to our consumers. We've done this through our strategy that we've created. This is kind of, you're gonna hear me talk about several key components and they all kind of relate to this strategy. Uh, we've also developed key messaging that kind of just creates a consistency for all of our communications across the board. And so some of the big points to that are going to be that we're promoting a lot of what Kate's doing, um, beef as a heart healthy protein. Additionally, we're just really trying to promote uh, Colorado ranchers to Coloradans. So that's really that um, it's it's the care that our farmers and ranchers are putting into the products that they are feeding the nation and the state with. Additionally, we're really trying to promote that um what farmers and ranchers are doing for the state itself. They are really doing more than feeding people. They are giving back to the communities. They are impacting the economic sector, et cetera. So one of our big initiatives here is sports advertising right now. Um, that's definitely something that's special to Colorado, I think, because especially Denver and and the greater Denver area is really a sports town. And so we're taking advantage of that. And so one of our big projects right now is we have ads in golf courses. We have three different ad campaigns um, going on three different courses. Um, so you will see that three ounce serving of beef ad, both of those on the screen. You're gonna see those in the clubhouses on the course and even in some golf carts, which is kind of fun. Um, our biggest partnership right now is going to be with NFL player Dalton Reisner. Some of you Denver fans might recognize his name. He is a Colorado native and grew up on a ranch. And so he really, Beef has a special place in his heart and we like working with him. So we're currently uh, working on different audio and visual ads that you'll see here soon. And lastly, we are working with the Colorado Rockies and Denver Broncos. This is a classic partnership that we've had for a while. And so whether you are driving down the road, tuning into the game, watching it from your couch, or even lucky enough to be cheering from the stands, you'll see a lot of beef industry advertising and a little bit of some shout outs to the Colorado Beef Council, which we think is great. Next, I wanna talk about our owned media projects. So this is really how we communicate with both our producers and consumers on different levels. Our goal here is really just to supply a lot of consistent messaging, positive information about the industry to our audience, which like I said, is both the producer and the consumer. And so something that tackles a bit of both of that is our news releases. I wanna highlight a great project that dabbles a little bit with the reputation management, 
Right now we're working on an op-ed, hopefully being placed locally in Denver that is on sustainability and really portraying uh, Colorado ranchers and farmers as the ultimate conservationists, as they always have been. So that's hopefully going to be placed in a paper near you soon. Uh, additionally, we have some press releases that have gone out. We usually try to issue them every one to two months. So we wrote a press release on our new board members and also that farm tour that was talked about earlier. And some producer specific communications really play a role in our owned media. So we have a lot of magazine inserts that we provide updates for, like the one on the screen here. I'm sure probably a lot of you are subscribers to some of those. So we work with our industry partners to kind of have them help us push out these updates, whether it's the projects that we've been working on or the new research that we've gotten from the rest of the industry. And so that's really our way of communicating those. Um, like you'll see also, you know, Todd's always driving around the state. He's giving presentations, talking to producers. We also give him a lot of other things to hand out. So we've got flyers like the beef directory flyer, how to get involved in that, like Julie was talking about, or there's also the consumer dashboard and that's going to be, you know, the, the most relevant research. And so producers can take that home and then they can apply that to our, their own practices. So really the goal here is just to how we can best get the information that we have out to our producers and our consumers. Next, we are gonna talk about social media outreach. This is also one of our big focuses. Um, and really the point here is that it is one of the easiest ways for us to reach our audience at really a cost-effective way. And so some of our main focal points within social media outreach are gonna be sharing industry facts and information nutrition, and then the Beef It's What's For Dinner websites, always super, or recipes, always super popular, and then also our partnerships. I actually here would like to highlight that the interesting thing, because I get to see kind of the inside scoop on social media, is that the thing that performs the best is really sharing that industry information and the facts about the industry. And so whether that is, you know, best practices or just general facts about what the producer day-to-day -day is, um, those actually perform better than most of our general content, even the recipes. And I think it's because producers can see the value in that, but also consumers are so interested in kind of seeing that tie to where their food comes from, which I think is really, really valuable. Um, but to that point, our focus in our messaging and our social media is really to reach both the consumer and the producer. And so we do that through highlighting the BQA program, which I saw a question um, in the chat about how we can kind of highlight that. Social media is a really big area where we're trying to hammer down the point of BQA is here and it is a great program. And 85% of the meat that you're seeing is actually from a BQA certified ranch. Um, Additionally, we're also highlighting that nutrition that Kate is giving us all that great information and the industry practices and really the beef community in general, what that is, who they are and why they're so important. A couple of tactics that we're using in social media in general is just being consistent. Um, so we can be kind of that constant source of information. We're also using a lot of hashtags to kind of reach the people beyond our audience so that we could kind of keep gathering um, people to share our information with, and then also taking advantage of the campaigns that are already happening, whether that be in the states, nationwide, and from MCBA. Next, I'd like to talk about social media content and advertising. These go a bit hand in hand. They're different from our display advertising because we actually can take some of the social posts that we're putting out there and boost them for low dollar amounts. Uh, this on the next slide, you'll see that we really do get some really great results for not that high of a spend. And so the platforms that we are on are Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So Instagram's kind of your one-stop shop. We, we put everything on Instagram, usually a pretty calm platform. We have Facebook, also a one-stop shop, but maybe with a little more opinions. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. Um, I'd like to highlight a very special project that we have on Facebook. Um, every month we do a Live with Beef Facebook cooking event. And so we have a professional chef, Chef Jason Morse. He goes on there. He's very knowledgeable, super entertaining. And he chooses a recipe from the Beef It's What's for Dinner website every month. 
and then does like a little a training basically on it and usually has uh he'll have people on there to interact he'll answer questions it's just a really really fun event we boost that out to try and kind of entice people to get and more information on the industry through that. So we so we catch people with the fun cooking idea and then hopefully are feeding them more information about beef through that. Um, and then additionally, we are posting a lot on LinkedIn. This is kind of a different platform. It's more business oriented. And we are posting things like webinars and resources for nurses and dietitians because really those people are on there for um, professional reasons. So that's what we're trying to deliver to them. Here we can look at some of our social media stats. I'd like to kind of break this down a little bit for us. We have two different tables on here. One is going to be our organic statistics and one is advertising statistics. And so organic is really just the natural content that we're putting out and how it's performing. Um, as you can see, we've got followers. Those are the people that are locking in. They like what we're doing and they want to see our content. Side note, if you guys aren't following us, it really does help us to advocate in our industry. The more followers we get, the more we can spread our message. So at Colorado Beef Council on any of these three platforms. Um, but anyways, moving on, I'd like to, I'd like to, oh, sorry, back one slide. Wrong key terms. Um, I'd like to explain impressions and what those are and why they are so important to us in social media. So impressions, really, I'd like to explain them as the eyes that are hitting our post. And so you'll see we have some really great impressions, especially in our advertising. That is why we do our boosting at the low dollar amount, because we can get some really great impressions. So those are the amount of people that are seeing our posts. And some of them are even seeing them more than once, which I say the more the merrier, because if people are seeing our messages more than once, it really means that they are, you know, it's they're being impacted, hopefully. It's not just a general scroll through your social media. They're seeing it, it's resonating with them. And maybe next time they see it, they're gonna be like, hey, I'm gonna go check out the Colorado Beef Council and see what's all about. Um, and lastly, I would like to highlight engagement rate. I know that that maybe goes over some people's head, but it is the percentage at which people interact with our posts. And so that goes farther than just seeing them. That's okay, they like our content. So they physically like it, they comment, they share it. Um, and that really goes a long way in spreading the word, but also just building a positive perception for us on our social media platforms. And the, the last thing is that I would like to highlight is that in social media in general, the industry average for engagement rate is 3%. So on all of our platforms, we are above, but in most of them, we are well above, which is really awesome because that just means that the people who are interacting with us on social media are generally really interactive, which means that they're hopefully enjoying the content and sharing it forward. All right, and I'd like to talk about our display ads. This is our other type of advertising. Uh, the first four things on this bullet list is are things that we are working with and CBA on. They're just helping us execute these projects. So first, I'd like to talk about YouTube. So a lot of you probably look up YouTube videos. It's the pesky little videos that you don't necessarily want to see um, that lock you in for the first five seconds before you can watch yours. Well, we are participating in that too. So hopefully next time you get one of those, it's really us spreading the good word about the beef industry. Next, we have search engine ads. And so those are when we've kind of created this pool of key terms. Somebody looks up easy recipes, what do I eat for dinner, easy beef recipes, and it is going to pop up at this right on the search bar with a sponsored ad directing those users to the Colorado Beef Council website and hopefully related to whatever they were searching. Um, next, we have content TV, and so everybody loves their favorite channels. We have ESPN, HGTV, Discovery, Food Channel, that sort of, all those good channels, and so we are advertising on those, so when people go to sit down on the couch, they're, they're hungry, they're on Food Channel, it's going to pop up with a little burger ad or something related, and hopefully that will entice them to go, go to the store, get on Uber Eats, whatever it is, and um, promote the beef industry. And lastly, for NCBA ads, we have display. Those are just the general ones that you see on the internet. Um, the ones that you see on the screen, the dinner is better with beef. Those ads are just going to pop up on the screen momentarily, hopefully drive people to the website. Um, and lastly, aside from NCBA ads, we also are doing sale barn ads. 
It's probably some of the things that you guys are seeing in your local sale barns. Those are producer focused rather than consumer focused like the rest of them. One of the last things I'll share here is a campaign that we are participating in. This is um, a nationwide campaign created by NCBA. It is called the Anthem Campaign with the theme as Together We Bring More. Originally it was Together We Bring More to the Table, but wanted to keep it short and sweet. Basically focuses on how beef can bring families, communities and traditions together and be at the center of all of those things. And so we're using the videos, images, audio and general theme. And you'll see that probably a lot in a lot of our content. So there's just a quick video you can watch. What makes you feel appreciated? <laughs> Patting yourself on the back? Or celebrating a job well done? Together, we bring more beef. It's what's for dinner. You can go to the next slide. It's perfect. All right, the last thing I have for you is just a little ask. So we are hoping to find more photos of youth and agriculture in Colorado. And so this is really just to show what the industry is all about. I think it's a great way to connect the producer and the consumer because not only are producers wanting to see that interaction, but it also helps the cons consumer kind of understand that it is more of a, you know, the industry is more than just the one person, the one rancher, it's a community, it's a family. And so if you have photos or know someone's photos of your children and their friends participating in the industry, I'd love for you to send them in if you are interested. And so all I need is a photo, a contact name for the photo, the names of all the children, and just so we can get permission from each of the guardians to use the photo for advertising purposes. So if you guys are interested, you can send that to me at Sarah at coloradobeef.com. And Todd, I think it's back to you now. Thank you, guys. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. So the last segment of the presentation today will just be about some of our international marketing uh, programs and why that's important to the industry. Um, we'll get launched into that. Traditionally, um, Colorado checkoff dollars have gone into uh, programs that are on the ground uh, working overseas uh, through the U.S. Meat Export Federation. And typically, the last several years, um, we have focused a lot of our efforts in Japan, Korea, and China. And um, those have done really well for us. And the reason we've done that is because if you look at that, that picture on the screen there, and that inside that circle, more people live inside that area than outside of it. So when you're looking to try to increase the number of mouths eating our product, you go to where there's more mouths, right? And so traditionally we have focused in that Asian, in that Asian area. Um, <clears throat> But um, our, we, we're doing a little bit of shift in that with uh, the geopolitical things, the status of the way things are. Um, we think it's important that we need to start, look, while that will continue to be a focus of the, of the American beef industry, we need to start focusing a little bit more on some developing markets. So this year, um, Colorado Beef Council is um, allocating dollars through USMEF um, to go more towards um, emerging markets. And these are gonna be areas more in uh, Central, um, South America, and then also in Africa. Uh, African continent has got the, the largest um, the largest segment of the next society that's growing, that, that's coming through population-wise um, than anywhere else in the world. And so we're trying to put some money in towards those markets to get them ready so that when um, that market matures and those consumers are ready to start purchasing product and food products on their own that the beef industry is, is well, well established and ready to respond. And what's in, interesting, I mentioned this at the beginning of, the, of our webinar, um, in 2022, our, the export value per head for fed head of cattle <clears throat> comes out to $447. <clears throat> That's huge when you think about it. Um, this this chart here shows um, export value and how it's grown, and and I think the reason behind why that's grown is we're we're becoming a lot more sophisticated in how we're um, <clears throat> promoting product to areas that we didn't that we didn't know that 
were interested in our product before. Um, if you look at this, this chart here of how a carcass breaks out, um, <clears throat> it, it really talks about how um, other areas of the world desire some of those products, right? And so you see where there's value in each of those that go out. A lot of times, if you look at what those export cuts are on the left, those are going to be cuts that traditionally here in America are of lower value. People, consumers just don't know how to cook with that or it's something that they're not used to. They don't know um, how to prepare it and things like that. But people outside of our country will, will utilize, utilize those products and even pay higher dollar for them. What I think is interesting, if you look at variety meats, which is a big portion of uh, the beef carcass value exported, um, if you look at that, how many of you here have um, prepared kidneys? Or maybe even liver, it maybe was, was, was more popular years ago, but not as much, or stomach, intestine. When you see a lot of these products in overseas, they're of high value and people are actually spending high dollar to that. And so that's where you see that, that increase in carcass value come from these export prod products. Or maybe here, it might even be a discount to get rid of that and processing. With these export markets, actually people are paying us high, high dollars for that. If you're to look at um, export value um, per head, and this is um, for uh, the United States in general. So you take that $447 and this breaks it out, um, which countries, um, which percentage of, of that uh, dollar amount um, comes from which country. Does that make sense? So we're looking at uh, uh, Japan, Korea, China are, are the, the majority of those, of those countries. If you're to look at Colorado, um, proud to say that Colorado is the fourth largest beef export state in the nation. You look at the diagram there, you see what countries are purchasing, are, are importing more beef from, from Colorado. So that's South Korea, China, Mexico, and Canada, and Japan are the, are the big ones. And if you were to look at our total dollar value last year, um, exports contributed at $1.65 billion dollars. Um, and then here is some of the, you know, four of those top markets. These are the, these are the, not only the dollar amounts for each country on the left, but also on the right of each flag there, the percentage growth from 2021. So you can see um, all pretty healthy there, but those are all adding a lot of value to, to what we export. Um, one, of our, one of our really neat export projects that we worked on um, I see we're right on time here, so I'll wrap this up. This is the last project that uh, I'll, I'll talk about. Um, we did a project through um, CSU's Center for Export Excellence. And um, what we did is partnered with HEB Mexico, um, came up to CSU campus in the new meat, uh, in the meat science building up there, and uh, did some product development and did some product development work, taste testing. And then they took that information back down to Mexico, created a new product. And actually what's happening is that from a $15,000 investment that the, beef, that the Colorado Beef Council invested in this project, it's now generating 10 to $12 million in product sales for HEB Mexico. And this is product that's coming straight out of JBS and Greeley. So that's, uh, that's actual Colorado beef that's actually going down for this, for this product. It's pretty neat. So what it, what the objectives were here on here on this project was to get some um, determined tenderness, flavor profile, production time, things like that to develop this product that would be utilized down in Mexico. It's called Cortadillo. And um, what we did is we did testing from a lot of uh, lower value cuts and we had some higher value cuts. We wanted to taste test the difference, what consumers might think tasted better than another and then see what is easiest to break down, you know, uh, labor wise, and then what we could do um, to get product down there. So we had to use the, the test kitchens up there at CSU. Um, we cooked the different cuts all the same way, the same kind of sauce and everything. We had consumer test, test panel there going through there and they were checking everything out. And what they decided on um, this finished product, it's been really well received in Mexico and there's what it looks like in the stores down in Mexico. So again, that is a minimal dollar investment for a huge, huge value. And what that is, that's moving product from Colorado packing plants down and, and exporting out to, to foreign countries. So it's a great success story. We're looking to hopefully do something similar again this, this coming year. 
Um, my closing slide here, just to um, want to advocate, um, come to our website, cobeef.com. You'll find information, videos, um, opportunities to, to buy swag that helps um, helps fund the uh, the backpacks, uh, the beef sticks for backpacks program that we're, we're uh, strong supporters of. You can order banners and stickers and things that, that you might need to help with your outreach um, and education as far as the beef industry. And again, we also partner with CSU on the beef quality insurance program. So be looking out for um, certification programs and trainings uh, that are go there. But anything else you need, go to cobeef.com. Um, you can find those resources there or at any time call our offices and we'd be happy to help. But again, thank you for the opportunity to, to present. Um, we value the partnership with the Colorado Livestock Association and we enjoy, enjoy doing all that we can to help pr promote uh, the beef industry in Colorado. And thanks for your support. And uh, we'll turn it back over to the CLA crew. Thanks, Todd. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Julie. I appreciate all of you being on here today. And I appreciate all of you those who stayed on through the uh, whole thing. And I hope that we were able to answer your questions and provide you some good information today. We really appreciate the partnership with you all and the hard work that you do for the industry. Um, if there are no further questions at this time, looks like we're right on time. We hit the one hour mark exactly. So uh, please reach out to your CLA staff if you have additional questions. Um, that is our first initial and our last name at coloradolivestock.org if you need to reach us. That is the easiest way. Uh, Jessica Limo, you're still on the line. Yes. <laughs> I have anything else that I miss. <laughs> I don't believe so. All right. Well, I'll give you back the rest of your day. Thank you all once again, and hope to see you soon. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank you.